All right, my name is Brian Streisick. Uh, I am an architect at Kennelly Architecture and Planning, and I was also the AIA East Bay Board of Directors president in 2022. Um, one of my goals as president is I wanted to start a lecture series really promoting the East Bay and, and the design of the East Bay. So like I said, this is the second year that we've done it. Um, this year is, is a good, I think it's a good twist. We had a really great panel of people last year. You can look at the poster back there, see who we had. Um, and this year is shaping up to be um, equally as good and exciting. What I, what I like about the twist this year about the having owners and architects involved in the presentations um, is that we, we hear architects speak a lot about architecture without hearing about owners, uh, the process of social engagement, all, all the things that go along with a project. And we all know that owners are really key to making um, great architecture. So um, I think that this discussion is gonna be great. Um, so the, the, all these presentations for the year, um, we're gonna concentrate on a project type. Tonight, we're talking about education. We're gonna go from higher education to um, high school education campuses and really dive in hopefully and talk about the challenges of the projects, how the architects are hired for it, um, talk, of course, promote the successes of it and hopefully get into a little bit of um, conflict resolution of how when things go, go awry, how do we get it back into uh, oh, wonderful. That, that's you, right? Chuck's going to talk about that. Um, <laughs> so um, we, we had Chuck scheduled for the Legacy Lecture Series last year. He couldn't make it uh, last minute. So we are re 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 we asked him to return due to his experience and just his general um, energy. Um, so I'm really excited about that. Um, he's going to talk about a lot of projects at UC Berkeley. Um, all the other lectures are going to be about single projects. So you really can concentrate on those relationships, um, and, but I think it's gonna work wonderfully. Um, tonight's uh, moderator is gonna be Yasmin Warbis of Ultra Modern, and she's also a professor at UC Berkeley teaching undergrad architecture. Um, she recently moved back to the Bay Area and she will um, introduce our presenters today and um, keep us all on track, hopefully. Uh, let's give a welcome to Yasmin. Thank you so much um, for the introduction and welcome. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, it's great to see you all. Um, so I'm going to uh, give you guys a little bit of an overview of, of the kind of, you know, what we're doing tonight. I'm going to introduce our panel. Um, we're going to have about, we're going to have presentations by both teams uh, where they talk a little bit about their collaborations, um, past projects in, in this case, and, 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 and a project that they have worked on together. Um, so we can start to understand how the architect and the client have, have collaborated in the past. Um, and then we'll have about 30 minutes of, kind of moderated discussion. And we'll also leave about 30 minutes at the end where you guys um, can ask questions and um, bring them to the panel. So definitely start thinking about those questions. Um, so I'm going to introduce our panel um, at the very end. To my very left, we have Chuck Davis. Um, he's an architect. He's founding principal at EHDD. Um, and he has about 50 years of experience. So he's recognized as an expert in the design of aquariums, zoos, museums, and higher education. He's won numerous awards, including the Maybeck Award and also the Wendy Fisher Award. Um, then uh, we also have Wendy Hillis um, from UC Berkeley. Um, she has served as assistant vice chancellor and campus architect at UC Berkeley since 2019. Um, she provides strategic and long-range planning for the programming, design, and development of campus properties, including buildings, infrastructure, and landscape projects. Um, this includes the oversight of uh, $3 billion worth of active design and construction projects. Um, she was also the campus architect at Tulane University from 2016 to 2019. Um, and in our second pair, uh, we have Stephen, Stephen Hughley, uh, principal and studio director at Jensen Architects. Um, he's led a diverse set of projects um, at Jensen, serving K through 12 education, um, university and arts and culture sectors, and also a studio director. Um, Stephen really kind of cultivates the firm's design focused culture. So, and then last but not least, uh, Monique Devane, um, who's the head of school at the College Preparatory School in Oakland um, uh, since 2011. Uh, she's worked in independent schools on both coasts, 
um, and in the Midwest, serving as a college and guidance counselor, director of admission, director of development, and an assistant head of school for academic affairs. Um, also ha has ex extensive experience um, on nonprofit boards and presently chairs the um, board of the National Association of Independent Schools. So thank you all for joining us. Um, I'm gonna start um, perhaps with a question about uh, just the kind of architect and uh, owner relationship, what, you know, to talk a little bit about what it means to work together. Um, so I'm curious, uh, actually, I'm sorry. We're going to start with the presentations. <laughs> My mistake. <laughs> All right. I'm going to hand it over to you two to, to start us up. Chuck has a presentation. <laughs> Hi. Well, I'm going to talk about uh, what it's like to work to, for the university from the architect's point of view. And um, uh, so, you know, the first question that I ask is, uh, you know, why I work for the university. And uh, so I always thought that if you're gonna work with the best and brightest, this was the place to be. I mean, UC Berkeley is the number one public university in the world. And uh, so I've worked for deans, professors, and a Nobel Prize winner. So that pretty much, you know, says it all in, in terms of uh, the kind of people it is to work for. The slideshow is just, I'm just going to run uh, images of the projects they worked with over the years. It starts in 57. Uh, uh, well, it starts when you were a student here. <laughs> well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> but I, I didn't consider myself a project manager yet. <laughs> so uh, the, the next thing to talk about is process and uh, University issues, you know, RFPs for all kinds of buildings, classrooms, research labs, engineering labs, uh, housing, large and small, and also infrastructure. So it's a huge uh, mix of stuff. And Wendy uh, will talk about uh, trying to manage all that. I would say if uh, if you want to apply, don't apply if you don't have relevant experience and a passion for the project. Uh, joint ventures are not something the university looks forward to unless it's been a successful joint venture in the past. <laughs> also, architects don't write very well, so uh, hire somebody that can write. <laughs> uh, my process, well, uh, the office of the process was about listening. Uh, you know, that old phrase, you're not listening to me, uh, is really valid. Uh, you're talking about uh, building committees with faculty who are extraordinarily bright, who uh, cut to the chase very rapidly. Uh, so listening is extraordinarily important. <laughs> I'd say uh, next on the list would be <clears throat> the ability to compromise and not get your ego twisted. Uh, and I think uh, one of the things that's helped me over the years was a sense of humor uh, because, uh, um, you know, this these are very, very serious uh, projects and uh, require a lot of effort and a lot of time. And uh, uh, they're, they're worthwhile, extraordinarily worthwhile. <clears throat> but they are uh, very uh, complex. If you get the job, know that everything in the conditions of the contract is expected of you and that the university will expect these conditions to be met. The process will be linear. Above all, design excellence is expected. Remember that every building committee is different and your process must be tailored to the way the building committee wants to work. And I mentioned this specifically because again, you're dealing with the best and the brightest so that the committee structure, the way it operates, et cetera, is gonna be very much a part of what the Dean uh, thinks about. Another item really critical in these days and times is uh, budget control is part and parcel of the deal. 
And in this area of era of price escalation, the very demanding requirement, but the U expects it. And the state funded projects in particular are, are really tough because there's a set amount of money and that's it. I'd, I'd like lastly to sort of say that the construction documents are extraordinarily important. Uh, if you don't have technical chops, get someone on your staff who knows what they're doing. Crappy docs will ensure that you don't work for the university again. Um, so that's kind of what I have to say to begin. And uh, I'm sure you're all dying to hear from Wendy. So Wendy, take it over. Okay. Um, and I am lucky in my current role that I have a design review committee um, that meets monthly and helps um, helps me think through design approval. Ultimately, at the end of the day, I'm the decision maker, but having folks like Chuck and Stanley Sadowitz and Kathy Simon um, on a design review committee for lively and active conversation. <laughs> it's fascinating to me, you know, when the non-art, when I first got to Berkeley, um, I was told by the vice chancellor that I reported to at the time, who was not an architect, that this design review committee was just out of control. <laughs> because they didn't like anything they were so critical they didn't like anything and they didn't agree with each other and they all had different opinions and then I went to my first DRC meeting and I was like I think this is just architecture like I don't think anything's gone wrong but it was interesting to get the perspective of somebody who had not been inducted into that culture and what they thought of it and a lot of my job is translating um, between working with the architects and working with super smart people on the other side of the table, sometimes who can't read plans, but they don't want to admit that, um, sometimes who have questionable taste um, and trying to come in within budget. I would say, you know, most importantly, in terms of what we're looking for in architects, our partners, um, we will put out RFQs for jobs. And, um, you know, an RFQ defines what we know about that project in the moment, but we're still going to find out more about that project as we get into design and we start working with different people. And I need, I'm open to that conversation. I need to have an architect who's open to helping co-define within parameters and budget and schedule what that is. What really worries me is when an architect comes, um, with this pre, with this design out of the box, right? And we haven't had a conversation yet. And I'm like, how can, I don't even know what it is. How can we possibly, how can we possibly know? And I think this gets back to, you know, you mentioned joint ventures. And I think our position on that has changed a little bit over the years. I mean, we're in a position now where, you know, as we work with architects who are outside of the Bay Area, they will always need to be partnered with a local um, who, who, preferably has worked at Berkeley before in the UC system, understands how we do documents. Um, and I mean, it's just risk management from our end of the table is here for is here for CA. And I really do believe that people who know how to partner and value partnering as a basic firm ethos and as a basic idea of being an architect are good partners. So whether or not you've partnered together before, if you have, it's an advantage, but you know, I have a number of firms that I know who run through partners on every single project and they never come back to the same partner. And I, it raises questions for me about, <laughs> you know, because I hear things, how good of a partner are you? I really do think that people who value partnership make good partners, regardless of whether they've worked together before. And that's very telling to me because ultimately I'm looking for a partner and I'm looking for a partner who is willing to have difficult conversations they're going to be problems um, and not pushing things down the road, having really direct conversations. I'm here for it. And sometimes I will, you know, instigate it. Um, and it's not my favorite thing. I don't think anybody loves it, but um, you know, being willing to work through that, those are the people I want to work with again and again. In case in point, Chuck, you know, I don't know if we're going to have a picture of it or not. I mean, there's a project that you came into for us in construction, where we fired an architect um, at the end of CDs, mostly because from my understanding, it predates me, they didn't understand they were from Europe. 
they did not understand how to write specs for a publicly bid where you couldn't do sole source. That seemed to be the biggest gap. No, there was more than that. Oh, was there more than, okay, there was more than that? <laughs> but like, what was it for you? Way more than that. And, and you know, you came in because you were a trusted advisor and you had this relationship of all these great projects. Yep. And my understanding is that we understood that you could, and let me know when I need to stop, right. that, that you, you know, that the, there was faith that you could see that through successfully. What are your thoughts on that? That's a really uncomfortable position to be put in, I think. Well, I, first of all, I was, uh, I was kind of flattered and honored that the university would uh, ask us to take it over. Uh, but it was a project in, in really severe trouble. The, the documents were terrible. The specs were even worse. Uh, and so I, I said, yes, uh, I said, the only, the only, uh, thing that I, uh, want to be specific about is that I don't want to have to argue about fees <laughs> and the university said, no, we'll pay you by the hour. So that's the way we worked. And, uh, we that tells you how desperate we <laughs> <laughs> I would never tell an architect to charge me like that. See, how did I pull that off? <laughs> um, what's interesting to me about that project, since I've been back five years, is that that firm continues to go after work at the university, right? And can, so there's a real disconnect there on my end. I mean, what do you understand about the fact that we let you go? And don't think I don't know that. I mean, I talked to my predecessor. I talked to other people. Um, and that's a really hard thing to overcome. Um, it is always the safest bet for us. I have a belief that I want to work with as many firms as possible. And I want to have a broad range of folks. I love being a curator of architects, for what it's worth. Um, having, you know, like a lot of different voices on campus. But it is always the safest thing for us to go back to who we knew and who has done projects successfully. And, you know, how do we how do we mix that up? I do think there is a very special place for firms in the Bay Area to have project after project with us if they come in as a partnered firm. Um, you know, I might only have one building with Weissman Freighting, or maybe two, you never know. Um, but, you know, and and one with Diller Scofidio and what, but there, the local firms who are providing that local voice are on project after project. I mean, I'm seeing people in this room who I work with on multiple projects. And I think um, that there's a great opportunity there because that's like the bread and butter of my relationships with architects or the local folks who I see on project after project and really understand our, um, our needs. So I'll leave it at that. Speaking of Diller Scafidio. <laughs> All right, as these uh, beautiful projects that Chuck's been involved with go through here, um, I'm going to introduce uh, my work at Jensen Architects, our work, as a sort of prelude into sharing with you our work for college prep. Uh, Monique Devane is joining us here on this panel. Uh, so a little bit about Jensen Architects. Ooh, okay, thanks. All right, Jensen Architects by the numbers, as it were. Uh, a couple of things to point out here. We have four core uh, practice areas, arts and culture, education, the reason I'm here today, uh, residential, both single family and multifamily, and workplace. And I'd argue that uh, the expertise in these core practice areas had an impact on uh, the project we did for college prep. In fact, most of the projects that we work on. Little sampling of the work we do. This is uh, the SF MoMA Sculpture Garden Edition. Um, we also transformed a um, a um, industrial facility into the Minnesota Street Projects. It's a a mix of galleries and event space. A little closer here today on the East Bay, we did an intervention at the Oakland Museum, an activation project. Uh, 
project for the Golden Gate Bridge anniversary, uh, the 75th anniversary. This place needs no activation. It uh, hosts over 10 million visitors a year. Uh, we worked with uh, Project Frog and GGNRA to build this visitor center and retail uh, building uh, for the 75th anniversary. Uh, we also work in retail. Uh, this is the shed up in Hildsburg. Uh, as well as single family. Workplace uh, for folks like Google and YouTube and some other creative types throughout the Bay Area. Um, increasingly, we're getting involved with uh, parks. This is a recently completed project that we teamed with CMG, the Willy Woo Woo Wong Playground in Chinatown in San Francisco. Uh, schools, the reason we're here today. Uh, we've done a series of projects for Children's Day School in San Francisco. This is uh, a middle school. Uh, we transformed a historic building into a series of classrooms and uh, meeting spaces for their uh, middle school. Uh, more recently, we're working on a mass timber preschool building for uh, them as well. That's currently under construction. Um, we do work for universities as well, uh, on a series of projects for UC Santa Cruz. Uh, this is a master plan study, and we have two projects, uh, that are currently, um, focused on community and, uh, student resource centers for UC Santa Cruz currently. Uh, all right. So the main event here, college prep school. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware of this uh, campus, it's in the Oakland Hills in this really beautiful uh, hilly siding. It's in a residential neighborhood. Uh, our site uh, is back here in the corner. Uh, it's a, it was a challenging site given the site logistics. Uh, and one of the uh, uh, design principles that we identified early on was to make the new building or buildings uh, relate to their um, scale and character of the existing buildings, which are uh, dominant throughout. You see this uh, cedar shingles and uh, the fenestration patterns um, that demarcate each of the buildings. So this is the site in between a auditorium to the left and existing classroom building uphill. Um, and before we started design, Monique invited us, the full team, to hang out with you. Uh, I believe for two two days, we were on campus learning about what made CPS unique, what what their DNA was. And so we spent time in classrooms, we spent time in special assemblies, and really got to understand the flow of the campus, which is unique to every school. And I think that's one of the key pieces of uh, doing academic work on a campus is understanding the unique culture there. Early on, we did a series of test fits, trying to understand how much capacity the site would want to take on to see if it aligned with the uh, mission of the school. We did a series of these illustrative uh, 3D studies. Early on, we identified the importance to integrate it into the landscape, one of the uh, character finding features of the campus. So you can see in this image, Wisteria played a, a big role in the architecture. Uh, this is a site section cut through uh, the campus. The, the new project, proposed project is on the left-hand side. We came up with a strategy to, to move the spaces up the hill uh, to reduce the amount of cut fill and um, Incidentally, this is actually our sustainability diagram. So we're kind of calling out our sustainability strategy, that of passive ventilation and lighting. And ultimately the facility was designed for zero net energy. Uh, floor plan of the lower area here. So we've got uh, in the center in the lavender hue is a student commons, the sort of the central area here. The project is right off the main courtyard. That was a part of the project scope is to renovate that courtyard. And then it's flanked by uh, academic um, admissions and counseling in yellow on the right-hand side. 
and then a food program in orange and support space in blue. And then the auditorium is on the far left here. But in addition to these core programs, uh, the design team and the school rallied around this idea of integrating the outdoor space into the program. So courtyard, lunch area, assembly seating, this unique sculpture park. Um, and this was also the, uh, the attitude of the upper level where we're integrating outdoor spaces amongst uh, eight new classrooms, IT lab, uh, math offices and such. And so in a campus where there's a lot of competition for real estate, it's a finite resource and understanding how to utilize uh, that finite resource to its best effect. Um, there was a lot of competition, a lot of conversations about how many classrooms. And I think early on, we aligned around the idea that outdoor space was a part of the core program for this project and indeed, in fact, the entire campus. Aerial view, um, looking at the, uh, the finished pro uh, project, you can see that the sloping roof sort of um, match the slope of the hillside here. You kind of move up through the hill side the buildings in this way sort of uh, reflect the natural landscape in their in their formal um, arrangement view from the other side you could see the renovated courtyard in the foreground here a seating around that in this main stair this zigzag stair as we like to call it zipping you up to the upper level it was a bit of a challenge to think about how to bring students that are largely working through single story buildings, a multi story throughout the campus, and how to bring them up and have connectivity uh, from those upper levels. Um, and one of the strategies that we employed here was having the circulation space always outside. So there are no interior hallways for this project. In fact, I think there's very few on campus at all. So the students and faculty move through these beautiful garden spaces throughout the campus. And uh, we took a similar cue here. And so a day in the life on campus, you see the students uh, moving up and down that stair. And on Tuesdays and Thursdays, uh, it's a full student body assembly in this courtyard. And so these uh, seating areas and the stair, in fact, the balcony above our line with students becomes a very activated um, space. So the uh, the buildings themselves, the stairway is sort of a sort of an apparatus to participate in assembly and other uh, social events. Um, there's also smaller pockets of uh, congregation space. Uh, it's a little smaller area behind the, the stair. Um, special uh, little outdoor classroom. Uh, we uh, worked with a local artist, Ala Akhtabar, who um, uh, designed these custom tiles that depict a, a starry night and installed them in this space that um, is uh, a perfect space for clubs, uh, classrooms, um, and casual social uh, engagements. Uh, speaking of which, uh, another social space that uh, student commons, thinking about how that connects to the outdoor space, uh, thinking about flexibility. So there's very little in the way of built-in furniture here. These uh, sectionals can be moved out and this can act as a pre-function space for the auditorium. Classroom space, thinking about flexibility, change over time. While well, we had a specific program, that of math classrooms for the most part, thinking about, well, what happens when it changes to, well, English class or uh, another another um, discipline altogether and how to facilitate that through a open, flexible design. Uh, well, this is one such uh, instance, taking a similar classroom and with furniture, turning it into a, um, a English English class, right? Um, another view on those outdoor spaces that's uh, adjacent to the main stair. Uh, the IT lab is in the background. This is a support space for the students and they kind of spill out and occupy the outdoor area between classes. 
um, view of those circulation spaces fronting the, the courtyard and a uh, charming evening shot uh, <laughs> as we exit the project. Uh, thank you uh, for that and turn it over to Jasmine, I think, to walk us through some some prompts. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for these beautiful presentations. I mean, beautiful projects and um, also just love the toughness of the projects. You know, I think there's a real sense that these buildings will last a long time and we'll probably see um, a lot of interaction from the students over time. Um, but my first question really has to do with um, maybe just asking you a little bit about the kind of uh, architect owner relationship and I'm curious what you think kind of makes a kind of successful collaboration between architects and owners um, you know Wendy you started talking about this a little bit but I'm curious to hear um, from everyone else way in there um, for the moment because I know um, when I hear about the scale that you work at Wendy it's sort of mind boggling when I think about our little sort of bespoke campus and what it means for us to invest in a project that would might seem small um, from some points of view but for us is you know definitional of a whole arc and uh, in a in the in the school's life and so it was so important for us to find that right that right partner and that right um, uh, kind of expert who would both bring their expertise but not let their expertise take over out of a uh, relationship to what we were looking for, which, you know, for me, when I think about our um, small campus, we needed someone who would hold... Um, <laughs> who would hold a sense of context as central to what we were trying to do. And when I think about context for us, that meant someone that would not only see the project through the lens of what needed to be built, but through the, 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 the setting, the environment, the complexity of a very constrained site and kind of recognize that for me as the head of a school that was very involved in a project like this, I always held the whole campus. I never saw this project as a singular bit that was going to get plopped down. I always thought of it in terms of the impact on all aspects of the school, all flow. And so to find uh, Jensen and to find Mark and, 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 and Steve, who just right off the get demonstrated um, a willingness to, to listen and a ability to pick up on that sense that uh, the relationship between built and natural environment was the whole key to this very small campus. And so to be able to, I don't know whether you heard that in what we were asking for, if you just saw that and that's how you approached, but we were really looking for that. And then the second part of context is sort of culture, right? And so for us, our school has a very particular DNA. It's a very high performance, low pretension culture, and we needed um, an approach and a um, shared vocabulary that let us enter into that uh, partnership with sort of confidence that uh, you were going to hear what we were talking about around both those sides of that coin, that high performance, high expectation, but this kind of informal and uh, kind of low pretension culture. We needed that to be represented not only in the physical design, but in the culture of the partnership between us. And then I think the last thing I would just add is that we were looking for a certain durability of partner. So that's kind of a, once again, a low ego, like high, high, high standard, low ego combo that for us was really important because I used to uh, work for a school that would take kids out into the woods. And one of the things that we always said is that when you go into the wilderness, that's when manners are the most important. Right. Because, in fact, when you embark on something, you don't know what the twists and turns are going to be, but you need the relationships to be durable. And you need to know that, um, for example, that wonderful blue tiled project that Steve uh, showed you, the need for that was actually introduced because we found out that we were going to be the first project in Oakland uh, built by a nonprofit to take on the new public art requirement that we had not budgeted for or anticipated, right? There's a million things that you discover when you embark into the wilderness of a project. And we knew that what we were looking for uh, was going to be um, good good partners in, in the face of the unknown. Um, and we absolutely felt that we found that, so... I like the metaphor of the wilderness, um, you know, embarking on a new project, 
um, getting to know the unique culture of, a, of a, either a university or a school and adopting the way you approach it to match and echo their own culture and also still bring your identity and your process and have confidence in that process, but to be in a spot where you can adapt it to echo their own, I think is important as well. And we, uh, yeah, I, I, I think it was very clear when you walk on campus, what was important, what was key in terms of the experience, this sort of, uh, environment as teacher, uh, it's very clear. Um, I think as a designer, you, you get it immediately upon walking through the campus if you're listening. Uh, and that was clearly echoed by the the team that you assembled around you, um, had that sort of, um, yes, d diversity of perspectives, but this kind of commonality in the fact that you're all rallying around the campus as a whole that was bigger than uh, the piece. I just want to add, you know, I would also say as a small, smaller project, I feel accountable for every dollar, like every dollar that some family has to pay in tuition, whether it's now or in the future or that I get in philanthropy. You know, I've, I've, so private schools are probably terrible clients because we have very high standards and we don't like to spend a lot of money. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> What was the question again? <laughs> I think you touched on this a little bit, but uh, I think this question of, you know, what you think makes a kind of successful collaboration between architects and so I do owners. Think, and the point has been made, you know, understanding the culture of the place um, or who you're working with. We're not Stanford. We do not have Berkeley. We do not have the kind of money to um, maintain the way Stanford does. On our campus, and so you're going to build something and assume we're not going to touch it or wash windows or do anything for 50 years. <laughs> um, you know, understands that we're good at mowing lawn, maybe not so good at pulling weeds. Um, and that our campus is just as much about all the space in between all the buildings as it is, you know, to your point about that courtyard, as it is the individual buildings themselves. And it's my job to think about how these things are all hanging together as a place. Um, and, you know, the worst thing, and I would never hire this architect in the first place, but the worst thing would be somebody who wants to make a monument um, with no understanding of what else is going on around the campus. There are misses though. So, you know, a great example is recently we're doing a new, I might get in trouble for saying this publicly, but I will. We're doing a new data science building and um, it is going to be the biggest building on campus. It's lovely. I'm not involved in every conversation because they're project managers that run on behalf of the university, but I became aware that there were $15,000 coffee machines specified for each of nine kitchens in this building. Um, <laughs> thank you. That's what I said. Um, <laughs> along, with, along with sparkling water and flat water on tap. And, you know, to me, that I understand why it happened in some ways in terms of conversations and the goals around these kitchens and looking at some models that the architects had worked on and how these things existed. But it was also a real miss from my perspective, both for our project manager and our architects in terms of understanding the Berkeley culture. I can't imagine that being built at the end of the day and having other folks who have buildings that are just crumbling around them who have a Mr. Coffee and a microwave, you know, coming into these kitchens and, and looking at this and not just being incredibly angry. And so I think understanding the politics of the place in Berkeley, it's just very political. <laughs> God, God love us. Um, it's, you know, that's, that's part of it too. And it was just interesting to me that for all of the conversation on these big moves, right? That's kind of where I saw it break apart was the kind of money we were gonna spend on coffee machines. Uh, well, I, um, I, I'd like to sort of talk a little bit about the committees and the architects. And uh, I, I just uh, 
you know, the committees are, first of all, they're made up of the best and brightest, but a lot of them have never <clears throat> participated in a, a building project or a major building project. And so I compare it sort of like to dating. Uh, the first three or four meetings, uh, I was always very, very careful to make sure that uh, we weren't going too fast, that everybody was understanding where we were, what we were trying to accomplish, and uh, and also trying to build up sort of uh, interpersonal relationships between you know, my my group, my staff, and and the uh, and the faculty, and. Uh, Wendy can touch on, touch on this better than I can, but a lot of some of the faculty are pretty cantankerous, and uh, yeah, entitled, right? <laughs> but they're cantankerous too, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so you know, it, it it's a uh, it's it's a very uh, complex uh, dance. I mean, you're you're you know dancing on eggshells a lot of the time, so I was always. Uh, I was always watching the room and making sure that people were uh, okay with where we were going and there weren't too many frowns. Uh, and I guess the other thing that uh, <clears throat> I would emphasize for all the architects here is that um, the faculty knows how they want to teach. Um, they know how they want to do their research. And sometimes, uh, you know, you know, and I, I plead guilty to this too. Uh, sometimes, you know, I was just convinced that I had the next greatest idea about, you know, whatever, and uh, was quickly corrected by the faculty. Um, so, you know, that's that's where the idea of compromise and uh, accepting the realities of uh, working the process of working with uh, this brilliant faculty. Well, something that Monique said, which was, um, you know, the, sorry, which was, you know, that your project is small compared to everything we have going on at the university. I just have dozens of your small projects that are just as important to the dean and the person in the college that they're serving. So there are people at the university for each project who are, you know, that close to it. Um, and I have to be mindful of that too. They're raising the money and they're hugely invested um, in what they're doing. And I have to make sure that they play fairly with everybody else on the playground. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're using the plural sense, right? And so uh, for, it's a very different, these projects for universities and campuses and schools that the client is a group of people. You, you mentioned committees, Chuck. And so you'll have faculty, that may or may not be even using the facility in the case of a UC committee. You have uh, student representatives often. You have um, administrators. You have the head of schools there on the committee. You might have someone representing finance. Um, and so coming up with a uh, inclusive approach that brings these voices into the process is is unique uh, to this project typology and takes a takes a little time to understand the vibe of the room uh, to, to, as you say to kind of look across the table and make sure everyone's on the same page and not too many frowns um, as well as have a inclusive design process so one way we approach that is coming to a workshop with the client group and presenting a range of options and kind of pushing ideas to their logical extremes so that you can have a conversation of everything in between. And usually you end up walking out of there with everyone having some thoughts about where you should land it along that range. And rather than coming with a solution, you're coming with a process. And it's a process that allows people to participate and uh, have their voices heard. And it's really important because you need 
you need these folks to be with the project from start to finish, which can be years. And so they're, they're investing quite a bit of their own time. And so you want to be able to fold in their expertise, their perspectives into the process and have them track through it, which I think is another kind of successful characteristic is continuity. Um, so that you have that, that, that core team from start, start to finish. You have a question, Yasmin? Absolutely. Okay. So, and this just has to do with how we're educating, um, you know, the next generation of architects. You know, it occurs to me as we all talk about how we want to work as groups, that it's very different from the vision of the caped, all-knowing architect, the Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, and yet I think so many architects go, it was so many kids go into architecture with the, we still haven't gotten away from that assumption about that's what architecture is. And do you see that with, among your students in terms of kind of a preconception about architects and what is being done in education to start to grow some of this collaboration? Um, because we never collaborated when I was in school. It was your individual project. You pasted it up. You know, you had your individual crit. Um, but that is not actually the way we work. So I'm curious. Yeah, I, it's a great question. It, it is contentious actually still <laughs> in school um, because I think it is typical for, um, I think, students coming into the field to assume that they have some level of authorship over their projects, right? And it's important for them to develop their portfolios so that you know they'll apply to grad schools and jobs later on. It's important for them to have a sense of ownership at the same time, we have been trying to do more group work in schools, um, which, you know, works a lot of the time. Sometimes it doesn't, you know, there's always like a bad breakup in, in those situations. <laughs> um, but it's like it's in a, a really important kind of learning experience. I think the other thing that um, has shifted or maybe would be interesting to do more of is to actually see faculty collaborate more. Right, rather than having a kind of single faculty member um, at the head of the room, kind of projecting their voice and opinions about a project, um, sometimes it's interesting to to kind of partner up with other faculty members with diff very different expertise, right? So that students can actually see these kinds of debates in action and understand that these kind of various perspectives have to be somehow resolved, or you kind of have to work through these disagreements somehow. Um, so there's hope on the horizon, but it is for sure a kind of slow culture to change. Um, yeah. <laughs> I love that answer because I do think I do think there's a whole broader movement within education that is more around um, collaborative thinking and a capacity to see interconnection and to perspective take. And that's now I think a more explicitly taught skill that we hope will feed all the way all the way up. I mean, I, I I feel like just starting with the idea that even when we say the project, the table stakes are very different for everyone in a team, everyone around the table. So when they're saying the project, each of them has a different vision of what actually that is. Maybe just to add one, one more thing to that is I think the students do get very excited when they see collaborations actually leading to projects um, greater than what they could have done themselves, right? So, you know, not only do you have two people working on a project, but you do, they typically do come up with with kind of more interesting things because they have to kind of work through um, their differences of opinion. So, and to kind of externalize their process. So I think it's a, it's positive. <laughs> I'm hopeful. Um, maybe related to this question um, is, is just how do you kind of overcome challenges in the design process, right? There are sensitive topics involved, budgets. Um, there's usually disagreements um, at, at, at several points in the process. How do you kind of work through those? Or how have you kind of successfully managed to kind of keep the project moving through those kinds of disagreements? <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> uh, well... First of all, you know, the first thing that's going on is that usually you have a time period to develop the design and schematics. So right off the bat, you're 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 feeling the pressure. But then, you know, we've talked about the collaboration and you know the committee structure, et cetera. But the architect, um, 
the architect is is really uh searching uh for a for a solution and it's a it's a combination of you know a thousand things i mean we've mentioned a couple of them like budget and schedule and all that but then you know the the real serious stuff is you know how how does the faculty want to you know do the work do the research etc and uh um that's that you know i i i just had this conversation with a architectural historian the other day and you know he was con constantly asking me like well what's the idea you know what's the big idea it was like there's like somehow there's one idea you know in, in these projects and you know there's hundreds of ideas in these projects and they're built up you know layer upon layer as you're working on it and Yes, you might have some uh you might have some premonitions, you might have some early uh feelings about it, but uh and I just can't emphasize enough how you know you're working with the best and brightest. And so you have to be really nimble and really flexible because they're gonna they're gonna I mean, I can remember so many times when faculty people just ask the most incredible questions and just flatten me. I mean, I mean, you know, what, huh? You know, how do you, <laughs> how do you answer that? And so, you know, I just, uh, I just, you know, I just really uh, think about these projects as, as layers upon layers and slowly building up the ideas to get to uh, an agreed upon uh, solution. And the other thing is that Wendy, uh, Wendy is very, very important because uh, she she is not only the campus architect, but she, she reports to a whole bureaucracy above her. And uh, that bureaucracy is very powerful. And they can, you know, waylay things. So again, nimbleness and an ability to compromise, and yes, a sense of humor, uh, will really help because it's, you know, there's great times, but there's also dips, and you have to be able to uh, to deal with those. Here, Wendy. Yeah, well, I was just gonna say you have to be willing to have difficult conversations and be willing to be uncomfortable. At the scale at which I'm working, I am not doing my job if everybody likes me and if everybody's happy with me. And I have to be okay with that. I'm lucky that I have great models. Carol Christ as a chancellor is an amazing model for being very clear and fair and decisive. And yet she's not trying to solve people's problems or be a people pleaser. Um, and she's been just this incredible North star for me in terms of who I'd like to be as a leader. Um, but, you know, I have to, I have to be comfortable making decisions that people don't agree with. Um, and there was something else super important I was going to say on that. And totally forgot. <laughs> but, you know, I don't think that that's, that's what, not everybody wants my job because of that, right? If you are, conflict averse, you don't want my job. Um, and, you know, I do have to have a sense of humor about it. Oh, what I was going to say is, you know, I've been here for five years and there was, and I, I'm really very easygoing, I think. Um, but I had, I, I had, a, I had a moment in the last couple of weeks where I was not easygoing in a meeting. I was downright horrible in a meeting. <laughs> and I was very aware that I was, but I was so frustrated by the way a project was going. And I also, you know, I said to the project manager afterwards, I was assuming that we had enough emotional credits in that bank account for me to say what I said. And it certainly got everybody's attention. Um, and that's the first time I pulled that out in five years. Um, and, you know, I, I do want to have good relationships with everybody. Um, but I have to be comfortable with people not always liking my decisions. 
I don't know why this is coming to my mind tonight. I'm thinking of a lot of wilderness metaphors, but the in um sort of wilderness survival scenarios, when you put a group in a very stressful situation, the thing, one of the things that determines the outcome of the group has to do with its capacity to recognize specialized expertise. So I think in a group process, it's very easy to kind of uh, defer to positional authority for everyone to turn, whether it's to the Superman architect or whether it's to whoever you think the boss might be. But in fact, the most successful teams are ones that can recognize who actually knows what you need to know in the moment and to know how to defer to technical authority rather than positional authority. And I think that's, I've found that to be useful. Yeah, but sometimes... <laughs> Sometimes we're the experts in the room and we're not recognized. <laughs> I've had that happen a lot. <laughs> That's the trick, isn't it? Is, it? is to know when to defer. Yeah. Like to know when someone else actually knows more. Yeah. And that person might not be the most positionally important person on the project. Yeah. It might be someone who's worked on a very small technical piece that has an insight into a structural material or into why something won't work or into a setting. And the group's ability to hear that person when they're like, oh, I have a thought, right? That, that's actually very predictive, I think, of um, the highest quality outcomes. Well, and understanding, um, understanding how to work with people to get your desired outcome. For those of you who know Mark Fisher, who is my boss, he's the vice chancellor for administration at UC Berkeley. Um, he's also an architect. Mm -hmm. He's the former campus architect, architect from UC Santa Barbara. And um, why he wants things like police and supply chain and HR reporting to him, in addition to me, I don't know. Um, but part of why I watch him and the ways in which he can assert his authority but not offend somebody and asserting that authority and getting what he wants at the end of the day. I mean, there are certain people that I watch and I'm like, I want to learn how to do that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's, it's a real skill um, to, you know, if you're not being recognized to figure out how to get that without the person even knowing that you're doing it. And sometimes he does it to me and I'm like, I am being managed right now. <laughs> yeah. There, there, there's something uh, challenging it's just inherent to these uh, to these projects. Um, it's hard. Challenges will present themselves, and uh, it's important to have, I think, alignment over agreement. It's all nice to when we all agree, and more often than not, we do. Um, but when there's a challenge, it's it's more important to have alignment on what's important to the project. And so you mentioned. Uh, conflict resolution, like when challenges present themselves. And I think thinking here is well ahead of that is to make clear what the, what the project is about defining those project principles and having broad alignment on why we're doing this and what's important so that when costs come up and it's over budget, we know what to trim and what is sacred because it's aligned with that project principle. And so having all the stakeholders share that is really important. And you only get there with transparency and communication early on in the process and bring everybody along with you. Because sometimes I think when you're in your position or the lead architect position, you don't even realize how people bend toward you because they want to make you happy, right? But that's not always the wise move for the alignment to the ultimate project goals. So I think when you're holding the positional authority, it's 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 knowing when, you know, I might exercise an opinion and I don't, the worst thing in the world would be for Steve to agree with me because I don't know what I'm talking about, right? But to, but to have the play and the go, the back and forth and the capacity to listen to the voices that aren't as readily recognized as the designated leader. I, I don't know, maybe that's part of that collaboration that you're talking about, but I, I think that's really, I, at least for us, I found that very useful. Yeah, so did I. Uh, many of you, many of your uh, uh, prompts were introduced with, what, what do I know? I'm not an architect, but this is what I think. And so you're opening up the table to either agree, disagree, come up with some hybrid solution, but the important thing is to have a discussion and so you're setting that up. Everyone around the table sees that. That's the model. And every stakeholder at that table is like, okay, well, I've got something to contribute. 
this is my perspective. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be, doesn't have to rule the day, but and so you kind of going around and everyone has a voice in the process. Uh, just a little sidelight to that. Um, you know, it, it took me a bunch, a bunch of years before <clears throat> I recognized that the importance of the deans in the uh, discussions of these uh, committees. Um, and in, in most of the projects that I showed, those are major, they're kind of major projects. So the deans were involved very heavily. And uh, the deans are very good at resolving conflict most of the time. <laughs> but uh, uh, the importance of, of, of a leader and a, and a, at the end of the day, somebody that says, you know, in the midst of this faculty discussion, conversation, you know, uh, okay, look, this is this is what we're going to do. This is the direction we're going to go. But I've had the experience where, you know, we had dean, we had a silent, silent deans, and that was really tough. That was really tough then. And, you know, it depends on Wendy and Mark Fisher and, and you know, a higher uh, layer uh, to uh, get resolution. Well, and not to belabor this, because I know you have another question, but one of the things that I wasn't aware of until I started working in higher education is that not all deans carry the same amount of power. There are differentials in power among all the deans. Um, it often, can I just say architecture is never at the top of that pyramid of power. Um, like that is consistent. Because it has everything to do with what they can fundraise at the end of the day and how large their program is. And so, you know, keeping, I'm always happy to talk to people about kind of the structure of the university and how people fall within the structure if we're really getting into some of these conversations. Because there are deans who are absolutely going to get what they want and they're bringing the money to the table. There are other deans who are not going to get what they want. And, um, you know, so they're not all created equal. Um, well said. So I actually, I wanted to open it up for questions from the audience. We would love to hear from you. Um, any of the topics that have been discussed or anything else that you're kind of curious about, um, that you're thinking about. That's a great discussion. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I once heard a talk from Ben Thompson, who was a partner with the Architects Collaborative, and he was talking about what you folks have been talking about and who's seated around the table. And there was one player who was not a dean, who was not a faculty member, not one of the usual labels around the table. It was a person who was in charge of maintenance. <laughs> and he, he had a good sense of humor. And he said, you got to be careful that that lonely person there who's in charge of maintenance without any badges or anything like that. He said, I consider that person as super janitor. That if that person throws a cloud over an approach, you better take very careful consideration of it. Do you have, does that happen to you folks? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> because we, we have no money or budget for maintenance. Um, and so what we do have money for becomes incredibly important. And, you know, there are examples on campus. We try to have those conversations early. I have the conversations with architects in as much as you have not shown any big belly garbage cans in your plan. And do you know what's <laughs> going to show up? A big belly garbage can. So you better find a good place for it or else it's going to go in a place that you don't want. And that I don't want. So being really pragmatic about what's going to show up on day two that you might not want to see and making sure that we put it in. Um, I am lucky in that our vice chancellor, associate vice chancellor, who's over facilities and management is also an architect. Um, so she has a um, aesthetic vision as this is all being accomplished, which I really appreciate because that does not exist everywhere. Um, 
but maintenance is hugely important. And, you know, case, case in point, new building that we have in design right now, looking at the fact that it is going to be $12 million a year to do the maintenance on this building that's being added. It has all glass handrails on the inside of it. Mm -hmm. The estimate for cleaning the glass handrails is $500,000 a year. We don't have $500,000 a year. <laughs> we don't even have $12 million a year to maintain this building. So, you know, going back to having to have a difficult conversation with the architect who is well known and has a vision around all of these glass handrails and what we're going to do because it's not going to look good on day 50 in here. So we have to be hugely pragmatic. And I was not taught any of that in school. It was all like, gravity is maybe optional. I don't know, do whatever you wanna do. Um, so, you know, conversation of maintenance did not. So uh, one of my favorite budget buster <laughs> at the UC is utilities. Uh, you know, you have a building here and you know, you're assuming that you go 20 feet and you connect a sewer and electricity and you know, whatever. But no, because the infrastructure is really a piece of crap. You have to go 750 feet to get the electricity, 400 feet to rebuild the sewer, uh, 500 feet to rebuild the water. And, you know, that's just, that's just the classic budget buster. That's the first thing I, I, after 20 years, that's the first thing I started looking at in estimates was how much is, you know, in there for utility infrastructure repair. And, that, you know, I don't, I, I wonder. No, it's you know, real. It, it's, it's really an issue because the infrastructure is, in some places in Berkeley, it's 70 years old. And, you know, it's in bad shape. So, yeah. Yeah, there's rarely an infrastructure project in and of itself that the university has to take these on one by one with capital uh, architectural projects to upgrade the uh, the infrastructure. I have a question. Thank you, by the way, for the presentation. It's been awesome. I have a question with regards to budgets. Uh, often, I'm an architect, and often we're pursuing an RFP where a budget's been laid out, and we prepare for an interview, and inevitably we can get that question, do we have enough money in our budget? So many of the projects we pursue these days with the escalation, we, we it doesn't pencil out in the RFP, and we know it's only going to get worse. In the spirit of collaboration and creating great relationships from the beginning, I'd love to hear from the panel on what's the proper approach for a, a firm that really wants to get in and wants to be honest, but also wants to win the job. Every project is not a project you want. <laughs> um, right? I, I mean, you know, having been on a firm side, and right, I mean... I think I can say about our projects on campus that we really have vetted where it's going to go at the end of the day. I would say like 95% of the time I have that little bit where, you know, there's a problem, but it's, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't have a great answer unless the client is really open to hearing what the budget will support or what budget is really appropriate for the project. The uh, the interview setting is a, a good opportunity for uh, the owner of the client group to, to learn about their project. So they're they're uh, reaching out. Maybe they put out a an invitation to a dozen or more, and then shortlisted maybe five to meet with right in the interview setting. And they're learning about uh, who their partner wants to be here. They're also learning about their own project. And part of that is cost. Um, and so, yeah, the, the question often comes up in an interview setting. And the way I've approached this in the past is with the understanding, whatever number they got to, there were certain assumptions that were built into that that I may or may not have privy to at the time. Um, but to, to, to tell them that cost is important, 
uh, to all the players for a successful project. And what we need to do is come up with a strategy to price out the project in an iterative way to update it. And as you mentioned, escalation, uh, I remember just a few years back, it it was uh, it was kind of out of control and could be the uh, the difference between a project moving forward and just not being able to be funded. But a project that doesn't recognize escalation is an even worse spot, right? And so that budget that's just too good to be true often doesn't integrate escalation to the midpoint of construction and you're you're deep into the process and you're only learning where it's harder to make changes throughout the design to get it back in, into line. So I, I think clear communication. Um, I think you had to choose your words carefully in an interview setting, um, <laughs> but I think you need to make it clear that it's it's something your 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 firm has expertise in looking at either with a contractor or a cost estimator and, and to bring those parties onto the team early on. And so we, we had, uh, rather than bringing on a cost estimator, we went the uh, pre-con services with a contractor route. And we worked with a really good, reputable general contractor, schematic design, DD, uh, through midway of construction drawings and had editor pricing along the way that became more and more pr uh, precise tighter and tighter contingencies um, in our case still over budget and we we had to make a course correction not with the design but with the con contractor partner in that case um, and so the architect playing a role in that and so when we kind of went out to bid so so we're um, again deep into the process we folded into the the sort of the contract documents, the bid documents, more information about excavation, cut and fill, heights of and depths of retaining walls, so there was more precision, so that they could have a tighter contingency when it came to some of those elements, which I think uh, right at our ship, changing partners, but also just more information about the the construction approach. Well, having confidence that that change wasn't just to make us feel better, but that actually the change was was going to let us get what we wanted. I mean, I loved what you were talking about earlier when you talked about making withdrawals from your trust account that you'd put in early. Like those early conversations, you're really poking each other to see like, are you reliable? Is this like, are you, is this what's, and I think having someone just tell you what they think, you can kind of feel that, smell that, right? When someone's just like telling you what they think you want to hear, it makes you not have confidence. Whereas people that can kind of, in a kind way, be um, educating you. Like I was very grateful for the honesty, that even if it wasn't always what I wanted, because it made me trust that when we hit something that was going to be even tougher, that we had a channel that was trustworthy. Well, Mark, um I I think another way to uh, approach the question <clears throat> is to say that in the schematic phase, which is the first phase, that the all of the assumptions in the area and the assignable and all that is going to be tested. And that at the end of the schematic phase, you will have generated so much more information about all aspects of the project, you know, the planning, you know, the architecture, setbacks, whatever it is. And that uh, at that point, the owner is faced with a couple of decisions, like one, cancel, cancel a project, <clears throat> which has happened <laughs> to me and you <laughs> and to all of us. <laughs> and But the other thing is to uh, revise the scope of the project. And uh, so, you know, one of, one of the two uh, options are, are good, right? but, but at the end of uh, <clears throat> schematics or 50% schematics, something like that, uh, you have so much more information that you can have a real conversation, a real dialogue about it, about the issues, about the problems. I think the architect plays a role um, in not pricing out the project. We don't have control over what those numbers are and what the cost of construction is. Um, but where we bring value is instructing the contractor to organize the information that allows the client to make decisions. 
So you're never going to have a question whether or not, I don't know, you're going to execute the foundation or not. It needs a foundation, but there, there's ways to, to try, we kind of call it chunking, like components of the project cost X and it becomes sort of a a la carte where you've got sort of the core project priced out above the line. And then there's sort of these add alternates or deducts so that you can have a conversation about, well, maybe we don't proceed with a couple of these to get back in alignment with our budget, but the core project is identified in its core cost. And so I think that's a, that's an important skill the architect can bring to the table to get those three parties to understand what that project costs. One of the best recommendations I've gotten in the last year for an architect I'm working with is that they are the best value engineer, engineering people I've ever worked with. And I was like, I never thought that would be like such a positive quality, but <laughs> I'll take it. And, you know, true to form, they've been amazing at looking at the intent and finding other ways to achieve that intent in a less costly way. I guess I have one more question over here. <laughs> you sort of already started to touch on it, but picking up on the thread of collaboration, you know, general contractors getting integrated into the process much earlier. Monique, this is more for you. You talked about that shared language, right? And scare, shared language around what academic space can be. How important is for the is it for the contractor to share in that language? Or is it more you're relying on the subject matter expertise of the contractor in a different realm? So is there benefit to having that shared conversation? Can your take on that? Well, I, I think you understand. I think you can probably predict what my take is. Uh, it's absolutely integral. Like I can't, I can't imagine a successful project without a contractor that is aligned with the values of not only the, the school, but understanding what's core to the project, it's it's a uh, it's an integral party. And yes, bringing them in early we find is often helpful. Not always an option for public bid processes. I understand, but in the private sector, rather than relying on a cost estimator to provide these numbers, you you have someone that has skin in the game that understands ultimately they're going to be responsible for delivering that project for the numbers that they're presenting along the way is I think uh, integral. I think it's part of what made it so scary to change contractors mid was that we felt like we'd sort of invested, but it's kind of like when you find out you're dating the wrong guy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you're just like, oh dear. <laughs> really, it's not you, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a little, I'm a little, um, I have a little bit of, uh, let's see how to say this. <laughs> I'm a little careful about the contractor uh, being the cost estimators in the early phases of the project. And the the reason why I say that is because contract contractor estimators are trained to only, only price the lines they see. They don't, they're not trained to be uh, to look at something and say, well, wait a minute, there's, there's, there's this, this, and this that goes along with this. And so you can get in really deep doo-doo uh, with that kind of situation. So, you know, what we, what we try to do over experience is we, we did work with some contractors, like, you know, we would, we had our top three contractors that we'd like to work with because we knew that they that they would have skin in the game and that they would be looking and and estimating, you know what what all was involved. Uh, but in a lot of cases, uh, we hired our own cost consultants, and I would say the other thing that got me in a lot of arguments with my partners over fees, but. I always insisted on doing a, a cost estimate, fifty percent schematics, and a hundred percent schematics, and that was just, you know, uh, the fifty percent estimate usually was scare the shit out of you, uh, and so, uh, you know, but it was really it got your attention. You really, you really knew right off the bat 
at 50% schematics that there was real trouble, real trouble ahead. So he had to really uh, re refocus and reanalyze what you were doing quickly. Because the other, because if you wait until the end of schematics, uh, sometimes it's too late. I mean, you were too far down the road. Yeah, the the deeper you get into the design process, your uh, your options to reduce costs start to yeah. self limit themselves, and so you have the most flexibility early on. So, yeah. a fifty percent SD cost estimate, um, you can really start to reshape the program when when necessary. Um, so. When you're into deep uh, construction documents and you're a healthy percent over the uh, value engineering options are, you know, fairly, fairly limited at that point. Um, so if, if there's a, a, a large misalignment, better to know that early on. Yeah. Well, and this is exactly why for the majority of our projects, we are doing CM at risk and bringing people on, you know, an early Early, as early as possible in DD for this very reason. Um, somebody earlier tonight asked me about progressive design build and would love to do progressive design build in concept. Um, I could never rely on anybody at the university making decisions in a timely enough manner to make that happen. So there have been great keywords like collaboration, being a partner, clarity, communication. So when you, Dominique, or when, the, when you interview during an interview, how do you evaluate those? And right now in the different project deliveries, those are one of the things. So besides the question, so for people that we are consultants or contractors, we love it when we know that in an interview, there's gonna be not just, oh, we're gonna evaluate all this, but there's gonna be something in which you really are gonna see whether the people really for the next three years or four years are gonna have your back. This is exactly why I am never interviewing. I'm gonna be careful about what I can say because we <laughs> are a public institution. The chances of me interviewing somebody that I haven't already been talking to and established and, date and dating um, <laughs> are slim. Um, and, and it's always interesting to me when we get, um, you know, proposals for something and there are firms I've never heard of. There are people I don't know. And, you know, if you're putting your hat in the ring as a way to get to know me for future projects, okay, that's interesting. And we can talk about that, but like that, if, if we have never had a conversation before, how can I possibly know what our relationship is going to be like. Then there's some fine tuning as we have interviews and, um, you know, we always try to think about how we're gonna, you know, do this so that we can get some insight into collaboration. But that's hard, like so much of it actually comes from talking to somebody before and establishing a relationship over time. So it's a long game. I would just say there's 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 the rubric with the groups you know sets before you're talking you these are the criteria you, that you think you're going to be evaluating and then there's reputation which is really so important and kind of gets to um, the most predictive thing of future work is past work so that's both the product but it's also the process and how folks that have worked with you talk about you and then there's also just the sort of intangible thing that uh, it happens I think. I mean, I can still remember sitting in the library conference room, and I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't I'm, not, I'm not sure this room where we were interviewing overlooked the site, and I don't know if it was you or Mark, but one of you like stood up and made a gesture toward the window, toward the site, and it was this kind of, it, it didn't feel showy exactly, but it felt like heart, right? And so that sense that you are, okay, here's how, here I'll, here's how. I'll, uh, talk about it. It's the difference between this is a, this is not original, but it's the difference between the good date and the great date. You know the difference between the good date and the great date. <laughs> that at the end of a good date, you say they were really interesting, and at the end of a great date, you say I was really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so that that's that's the third criteria: rubric, rubric, reputation, and being a great date. <laughs> 
I don't think there's any better way to end it wow. than that. So thank you so much. And thank you all for coming. I don't know.